relax, relax. First chapter, fr this is gonna get in on time, you got this. First chapter Friday is a chance for us. You got this. First chapter Friday is a chance for me and Miss Becky. I don't know what the heck I'm doing today. First chapter Friday is um, my chance to share with you Let's cheer it on. Yes, you do. You got this, Miss Christina. First cheer. No, you don't. I don't know. I'm, I'm so hungry right now. I'm just going to do it. Hello, my name is Miss Christina, and I am a teen librarian at the Newport Public Library in Newport, Rhode Island. And I would like to welcome you to another chapter of First Chapter. First Chapter Friday is a chance for me to share with you a wonderful book that you may not have discovered yet. And this week, I'm giving you kids a treat. I'm doing a mukbang because this video is about to be late. So this is a First Chapter Friday mukbang style. That's at least what I'm gonna tell my bosses if they see this video and they're like, why did you film yourself eating? And I'll be like, I'm doing a mukbang. It's what all the kids are doing. Yeah, yeah, this was like 2015. Everyone is doing it. This week, we're listening to Birthday by Meredith Russo. Eric and Morgan were born on the same day in the same place at the same time. And they've always shared this one day, their birthday, together. But as they grow up, they start to grow apart. Everyone expects Eric to get a football scholarship, but no one knows he's actually having second thoughts. And every day, Morgan wrestles with the difficult choice whether or not to live as her true self. This book deals with what it's like to be a teen who's coming out as transgender. Told one day, every year, over six years, this is a story about how change pulls people apart and how love can bring them back together. So sit back relax and enjoy the first chapter of Birthday by Meredith Russo. Do I have anything in my teeth? Chapter 1. Morgan. I'm holding my breath, hovering between wavering sunlight and deep, dark blue, arms twirling while my feet kick up and down, slow as tides. I'm not ready to go back up. Too much waits for me above the surface. But I know I can't just float forever. Life always forces you to move one way or the other, whether you're bursting into sunlight or swimming down. The pressure in my chest is soon too much to bear. I hold my arms close and wriggle my whole body shooting out of the water like a mermaid. A minute and a half, Eric hollers, splashing me with his excitement. I can barely make out his grin as I wipe water from my eyes. Told you, I say. I can see him clearly now. He's small, a few inches shorter than me, with smart, quick green eyes, shoulder-length blonde hair, and a narrow, angled face that swoops down to a point at his chin. You still want to take a turn, or do you just give up? Never, Eric says. He gulps in as much air as he can, holds his nose, and disappears under the water. I focus on counting out the seconds, lightheaded, even though I finally caught my breath. My heart is hammering. I'm going to tell him when he comes back up. Ten seconds. I'm going to tell him I'm supposed to be a girl, that I can't stand being a boy anymore, that I feel like I'm dying a little bit more every day. Twenty seconds. A girl a few years older than me in a red bikini strides by the pool, heading for some distant part of the water park. I catch myself staring at her body, at the shape of it, at how it moves. I realize I've pressed my forearms over my chest and forced them back down. There's nothing to cover. 30 seconds. Eric's parents and my dad wave from their table near the pool, and I wave back. I'm going to tell Eric, and if he takes it well, I'll tell Dad. It's not that I want to. I have nightmares about making things weird with Eric or adding more stress to Dad's life after everything that's happened. But more and more, it feels like I'm going to explode. I've tried holding it in. Every day I feel a little more numb, a little more monstrous, more afraid I'll look in the mirror and find myself twisting into a tall, hairy man who never gets to turn back. 
I've been thinking things that scare me about not wanting to be alive anymore, and I need help. Maybe that help is my best friend sitting calmly and letting me talk and telling me the way I feel is actually normal, that he's going through it too, that it's part of growing up and we'll pass through it together. Maybe that's my dad finding someone I can talk to, a therapist or something. I don't know. But whatever it is, it has to happen soon. I'm 13, and the bone-twisting terrors of puberty feel close. 40 seconds. How do you tell someone a secret like this? How do you put it into words? 50 seconds. And Eric splashes back into view, arms flailing. How'd I do? He rasps. Terrible, I say. He splashes in my general direction. He's practically blind without glasses. And I laugh. How long was I under? Not even a full minute, I say, splashing him back. Whatever, he says, rolling his eyes. We don't all have your natural talent. I run every morning. I say in a sing-song voice. I'd hoped exercising would stop being a part of my life once I quit youth league football. But when your dad's a coach and a P.E. teacher, it turns out you're stuck. Work as hard as me, and you'll be as good as me, scrub. I float on my back, closing my eyes as the sun warms my face and stomach. I take a deep breath. It's easier to imagine saying something when I can't see him. Hey, Eric. Yeah? If I tell you something, I say, will you promise to keep it a secret? Dude! Eric says, sounding almost hurt. Like you even need to ask. Good, I say. I open my mouth to tell him. My heart hammers. I glance to the side and find my best friend, a person I've known since the day I was born, watching me with open, curious eyes. Staring into them for too long makes my stomach tight in a way I don't like. So I swallow and I look back up at the sky. If my life were a movie, the characters would always know what to say, and the boring, disgusting, embarrassing parts would be cut away in a blink of an eye. Indiana Jones would never need to have this conversation, and Godzilla didn't have a gender. It stomped on cars and blew up buildings with nuclear fire. What a charmed life. So, he falls back into the water and rises, blinking his eyes dry. Then he flips his hair out of his face and smooths it back. My stomach dips. I sink until I submerge up to my nose. So what is it? I blow a stream of bubbles and look away. He wades over and dips his face, smiling and handsome. When he sees my face, his smile shifts the tiniest bit, showing confusion and frustration. I feel like I'm supposed to be a girl. I say it under the water, the sound coming up garbled. Did Eric make it out? He rolls his eyes. Fine, don't tell me, weirdo. He didn't hear. I feel sick. Weirdo. Eric swims away, clambers over the edge of the pool, and stands, looking down at me as I follow slowly. Our parents call us over, and I imagine saying it now. I'm really a girl. It sounds ridiculous. It sounds weird. We run to meet our parents, our wet footprints quickly drying on the hot pavement. Carson, Eric's dad, is wearing a big kahuna t-shirt and long black swim trunks. He's imposing, over six feet tall, with Eric's same blonde hair cut short and sharp green eyes that always seem angry. He used to like me back when I played football. I even thought of him as an uncle. But ever since I quit, he barely says anything to me, even when I sleep over at their house. I've always thought Eric's mom, Jenny, looked classic, like a starlet from a black and white movie. She makes me feel welcome at Eric's house, making sure I have a home-cooked meal whenever I'm over there. My dad, all rangy limbs and a deep farmer's tan from running around on the football field, gives me a tired smile and slouches back in his chair. Our parents have known one another for as long as Eric and I have been alive. They met at the hospital when we were born, trapped during a freak blizzard, the only September blizzard in Tennessee's history, apparently. During those three autumn days, Eric and I came into the world, and our parents, our families, became friends for life. Since then, we've done everything together. A shared birthday eventually becomes a shared everything. For a long time, our families were closer with each other than we were with our own uncles, aunts, and cousins. Then mom died, and not too much later, 
I quit the football team. At least we still do our birthday together. You boys ready for lunch? Jenny asks, lifting her oval sunglasses with a smile. I flinch at her casual use of the word boys, but I try to hide it. It wasn't always like this. It used to be a dull pain, the ache of a bruise, a faint confusion when activities split us up into boys and girls. But in the last year, it's grown unbearable. I might have said something sooner. Bigly remember wanting to say something sooner, but I actually used to like football. And I knew instinctively that two kinds of kids weren't allowed to play, girls and sissies. I didn't want to give up something I liked, and I didn't want to be made fun of. Back then, stamping down my confusion was easier, but over time it's turned into something like you'd see in a cartoon, where a character plugs a leak with their finger only for two more leaks to pop out in its place. Feels like only a matter of time before the dam bursts right in my face. Not yet, Eric says to his mom as he twists the water out of his hair. I want to hit the vortex. Our white and blue birthday cake sits at the center of the table. It says, Happy birthday, boys, in red icing. So even if the grocery store cakes didn't taste like trash compared to mom's baking, I still wouldn't want to eat it. I nod with Eric and try to look like I'm excited about the vortex too. Okay, dad says, starting to rise. I'll come with you. Hey, hey, Tyler, they're 13 now, Carson says, leaning back and sipping his coat. Maybe it's time to let the reins out a bit. Maybe you're right, Dad says, scratching his cheek. He looks at me, giving me an are you okay expression. My dad used to let me run around like a crazy person. He used to say it was good for boys to scruff their knees. But then mom got sick, and then she got sicker. And a year ago, she was gone. And ever since, it feels like he's either always on the football field, gone, or trying to put a leash around my neck. It's like we're both treading water around each other, unsure of how to act without her. I let my hair fall into my face. It's always easier to view the world through the veil of my hair. I turn, and with my eyes locked on Eric, we jog away from the pool toward the main walkway, closer to the looming shadow of the vortex. You okay? Eric asks as we get in line and start to mount the wrought iron stairs. I'm fine, I say. I have to tell him. I have to tell him. Is it because you're scared of heights? Eric asks. I look around, and we're almost to the top now. A breeze whips Eric's hair. A cloud of starlings wheels above the park like a school of fish. I'm not scared of heights, I say, rolling my eyes. I'm not scared of anything. What a lie. Then why are you acting weird? I'm not, I say. I look down at my feet and at the dizzying vista visible through the gaps in the wrought iron. Eric gives me a look like he doesn't believe me. But before he can say anything else, we're on the top platform with the dark, open mouth of a water slide beckoning. An attendant guides us to a small, yellow, inflatable raft and instructs us to hold the handles, not to stand up, not to leave the raft, not to do any of the stupid things teenage boys apparently do. Which reminds me for the millionth time, I'm a teenage boy now. It's official. I feel sick. Ready? The attendant asks us. I nod. Eric shoots his arms in the air and hollers. The attendant laughs, nudges the raft with a sandaled foot, and suddenly we're wrapped up in dark, screaming motion. The raft careens through the tube, riding so high on the walls whenever we turn that it feels like we might go flying. Eric laughs manically, shielding his face with his arms as water sprays us. I laugh too. The excitement builds and builds, eclipsing every other emotion, until I finally yell into the darkness, Eric, I want to be a girl. All right, Eric shouts. And I can't believe it. All right? All right, he said all right. I just let my body laugh, let the laughter twist and erupt out of me, like poison flowing out of a wound, and suddenly I feel weightless. A circle of light appears, blinding at first, expanding at the speed of sound, and then, and then we're bathed in sunshine, tumbling, flipping over the raft into the pool below. I'm the first to the surface. I tread in place for a moment, ignoring the rushing water, the screaming children, the music blaring over the park's PA. I told him. I told him. It's all right. Eric comes up a moment later, flailing and gasping for air, his eyes hidden behind a wet sheet of curly hair. I grab his arm and drag him to shallow water, sputtering and laughing at the same time. That was rad. It was awesome, I say, splashing as my arms fly into the air. All right, all right, he said, all right. What did you say in there? He asks me, panting. I couldn't hear. Oh, I say, my insides tightening up. He didn't hear. He doesn't know.
I had had a vision as I had gone down the water slide, or a cloud of competing visions, all paradise in their way. Eric telling me I'm normal. Eric telling me I'm not normal, but he understands, and he'll still talk to me and keep my secret. And distantly, but shining gold and warm, a vision of myself as a girl walking happily next to him at school as if it's the most normal thing in the world. The visions flicker out like heat ripples on pavement. My stomach keeps twisting, but it's useless to try to stop it. I slowly wade my way out of the pool, everything's spinning. I run to the nearest trash can, brace my hands on the rim, and throw up. <laughs>